Uh, my name is Sandy Baird, and I'm here with Beth and uh, Lou, who are part of a, new, a little group who is trying to, hopefully we're going to be able to establish a new institute called the Vermont Institute for Community and International Involvement. Um, and Robin is here also, Robin Lloyd, who is also very helpful in this regard. We've been doing this for a while. Um, the virus sort of interrupted our efforts, but we're back and we're going to be presenting this kind of semester, a group of legal seminars that the Attorney General's Office has agreed to participate in to get out some general education to our community, our whole community, uh, about the legal system of the United States. It's currently very much in the news. And so this is what we will be doing this semester. And next week, we'll be hosting an in-person speaker who will be speaking on the whole controversy right now about bail. And that will be with the state's attorney uh, here in Chittenden County, Sarah George. But with us tonight is Ben Battles, and he is from the Office of the Attorney General in Montpelier. Although, Ben, you're not in Montpelier, right? No, I'm actually at uh, my house in Waterbury, so Waterbury. I apologize Waterbury. if uh, you hear any dogs barking in the background. But okay, so he maybe can talk to you a little bit, bit about his background. Um, I don't know Mr. Battles very well, but I'm very happy that he's here to talk about tonight about the United States Supreme Court, um, the history of the court, its role, and it's, uh, you know, basically it's function in our system. It's very much in the news right now. And so I'm very happy to have um, Ben Battles here to talk a little bit about that. There'll be plenty of time, I think, for questions from our audience. So um, if people want to just say who they are, it'd be very helpful. I see that there's Diane Gottlieb, right? And the Peter Huber, all old. Hi friends and colleagues from millions of years ago. Uh, and then Joanne Murad and also Barbara McGrew. I guess I see Deb Bout maybe and Donna Pialka. Right. And Jody Albright. So we're all old kind of acquaintances. There's new friends in the audience who are also from this center. This is the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. We are within their building and their offices, and they are also co-sponsors of this series of seminars. And we thank you all really a lot for being here and for trying to understand a little bit about what's going on uh, without really talking too much about the hearings today, but just about the importance of the court and its history in general. Um, so Ben, why don't you give us your <laughs> thoughts on the court? Great. Well, thank you very much, Sandy, and thank you, Beth, and, and thanks to the association for inviting me to talk with you tonight. Uh, obviously, a very timely issue. Um, so just briefly, I, I work for the Attorney General's office, and the, the Attorney General is the lawyer for the state of Vermont, so we represent the state and its agencies in a, a variety of uh, all sorts of different types of cases, criminal cases, environmental cases. Um, and I'm a, my job is the Solicitor General, which is just a fancy title for uh, being in charge of the appeals that our office handles. So I, uh, I handle appeals at, um, in state and federal courts. So that's at uh, Vermont Supreme Court and the federal appellate courts, including when we have issues that go up to the US Supreme Court. Can I ask you a question then? Have you been at the US Supreme Court? Uh, I, I have. We had a case go up uh, several years ago that, uh, my predecessor in this job, Bridget AC, argued uh, at the court, and I was uh, the second chair, so I was there with her. I didn't argue the case, and uh, and we also uh, have filed briefs um, in various cases when the state has an interest. Great, wonderful. Um, so I was going to talk a little tonight about the the history of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, how it uh, has evolved over the couple hundred years that it's it's been there, and uh, and also talk about how justices are selected uh, and how the court decides which cases to hear and how it ultimately decides those cases. So going back to the beginning, uh, we'll talk about you know, in 1776 when the uh, colonies of uh, European settlers declared their independence from Great Britain, um, each colony had its own legal system. There was no central court for 
uh, the colonies. And then uh, that's, that's the way things remained in the first uh, constitution that the country had, which was the Articles of Confederation in 1781. And there, uh, the states, the colonies were really just treated as almost independent countries that had formed an alliance. And so each colony had its own court system. Um, and that changed in 1787 with the ratification of the US Constitution, which we still have. Um, and under the, the Constitution, it created a strong national federal government divided into three branches, the executive branch, which is the president, the legislative branch, which is the United States Congress, and the judicial branch. And Article Three of the Constitution uh, created the judicial branch and said, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. So that's where the word Supreme Court comes from, is from that constitutional language. Uh, it doesn't really say anything else about the court other than to define the types of cases it can hear, uh, which is uh, limited and, and the mo generally <laughs> cases arising from federal law and it didn't displace the state court system. So most cases still end up in state court, uh, but you do have this federal court system that was created. Um, and Congress uh, in 1789 uh, passed uh, the first Judiciary Act, which created a number of the lower courts, uh, which at that point were just the circuit courts they were called, with each circuit being responsible for a different geographical part of the country. Um, and it created, uh, and it spelled out some of the details of the Supreme Court, including the number of justices, and it created one Chief Justice and five Associate Justices. So originally there was just six uh, justices on the Supreme Court, there's currently nine, uh, and with each justice was responsible for an individual circuit, uh, and they would actually have to go out and ride around uh, on horseback and travel the colonies and hear cases uh, in those uh, in those circuits, and then they would convene a couple times a year to hear cases as the Supreme Court. Um, the first time the court actually convened, it was 1790, and it was in New York City, as that was the the capital of the country at that time. Um, and they didn't actually have any cases to hear yet because uh, nothing had their Primarily hear appeals from lower courts, so uh, they kind of got together and and <laughs> figured out how they were going to run things, but uh, uh, not much happened in those early years. Um, the first chief justice was John Jay, who was uh, one of the founders of the country, um, and he actually resigned from being chief justice to become the governor of New York, which is a uh, just an interesting bit of trivia. You don't often see justices these days stepping down to get into politics, but uh, times were different back then. Um, and I just wanna mention one early case that's really important for understanding how the US Supreme Court works uh, and how we talk about it today. And that is the case of Marbury v. Madison, which was decided in 1803. And it established the, the court's power of judicial review, which is the uh, their authority to look at a law and determine that it violates the, the Constitution and then declare that law unconstitutional and invalid. Excuse um, me, Ben, can I ask you a question then? So there's nothing about judicial review in the Constitution, correct? That's correct. Okay, so it was established by this very important case. Yes, right. um, and it really established that the Constitution was law and, and supreme law and not just this kind of statement of principles. Uh, it was an interesting case. It, it, it grew out of the election of the presidential election of 1800 between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and it was a very closely contested election. Uh, and John Adams was of the Federalist Party and Thomas Jefferson was uh, of the Republican Party. And um, 
it was very contentious. John Adams was the president at the time, but he lost re-election to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, but after he lost, he decided that he wanted to put a bunch of his judges through. Um, it might sound a little familiar to <laughs> other situations we've heard about, but uh, he's, his party had control of the Senate and he uh, uh, put a bunch of judges through, including uh, a man, William Marbury, um, and the Senate confirmed them, but they had not yet taken office by the time Thomas Jefferson uh, became president. So their commissions, which was the piece of paper actually uh, authorizing them to take their position as a judge, uh, Jefferson refused to deliver them. Uh, and so William Marbury sued and he, there was a, a, a statute that said this was the sort of case that the US Supreme Court could hear. Um, and so he sued in the US Supreme Court saying, you have to order the president to uh, give me my commission so I can become a judge. And the court, uh, in an interesting decision, said, we agree that, that Marbury should get his commission uh, and that he's entitled to it, but we disagree that we have jurisdiction to hear the case because the Constitution just gives this court limited jurisdiction and this statute that Congress passed gives us more than the Constitution allows. So that statute is unconstitutional and invalid. Um, and so it was a little bit of a sleight of hand uh, in that it seemed to be um, the court saying, oh, we can't do this, we have less power. But it, in doing so, it actually gave itself one of the most significant powers that it has had, which is to strike down the laws of Congress if they're unconstitutional. Um, so as I mentioned, when the, the court first convened, it was in the nation's first capital, which was New York City. Uh, it was only there for about a year. The capital moved to Philadelphia in 1791. And, and then in 1801, uh, the capital moved to Washington, D.C., where it remains now. And for uh, about 130 so years, the, the court didn't have its own building, and it was uh, kind of moved around different buildings in the U.S. Capitol building. And, uh, you know, at times when there was construction and different things going on at the Capitol, uh, I think it was burned down in the War of 1812, the court had to find other places to go, and it, it met at, at different times in people's houses and even in bars. Uh, <laughs> so it, was, it wasn't quite as uh, glamorous as, as it is today. Uh, then in 1935, um, William Howard Taft, who had been president uh, and then became Chief Justice of the United States, uh, he lobbied for and, and got uh, Congress to appropriate funds to build the U.S. Supreme Court building that we know today with the, the grand staircase and, and uh, very impressive courtroom. Um, as a, so the, the size of the court has changed over the years as well. Uh, when it was the first Judiciary Act set the number at six justices for each, one for each judicial circuit, and then as the uh, as the territory of the United States uh, expanded in the 1800s, uh, there was new circuits that, that were added by Congress. And so with each new circuit, there was a new seat added to the US Supreme Court. So in 1807, a seventh seat was added, 1837, a eighth and ninth. And then in 1863, there was actually a 10th seat. Uh, and so that was the the most justices that have ever been on the court was 10. Uh, and then in 1866, Congress passed a law that said the next three justices retire to retire cannot be replaced. So that then shrunk the court um, and two justices re retired shortly thereafter. So it was down to eight. And then in 1869, Congress said, okay, we well, think there should be nine and uh, we're gonna set the number at nine and that's where it's remained ever since. Um, there was, uh, as some of you may know, in the, in the 30s, President Franklin Roosevelt uh, proposed uh, what's referred to as a court packing scheme. Uh, and uh, under, his, under this proposal, um, 
and this was a reaction to the court striking down a lot of his uh, New Deal legislation and finding it unconstitutional. So he was uh, feeling, you know, that his good policies that were necessary for the country were uh, were being blocked by the court. So he wanted to get around them, and this was his idea to do that. And he said that every justice who reaches the age of 70 and refused to retire that would trigger a new vacancy on the court and and so that there would be a uh another seat would be added up to a maximum of 15. Uh, that uh that proposal was not well received in congress and it was never enacted um although the threat may have worked because shortly thereafter the the court did begin uh, upholding some of his new deal legislation um so you hear, you know, people are, are mentioning court packing these days, and that's kind of a, uh, what they're referring to is uh, something along the lines of what uh, FDR proposed, although I, I think, you know, there haven't been any concrete proposals yet, but I suspect if, if we see any in the future, it's probably to be adding one or two more judges, not to, not to be adding up to 15 based on the age of the current people, but, but who knows? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how the justices are selected. Uh, this also comes from the, the U.S. Constitution. Article 1, which uh, describes the powers of the president, uh, says that the president shall nominate and bind with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. Um, so that's all the Constitution really says about the process. The rest of it has is a result of uh, traditions and uh, the rules of the Senate as for what uh, their advice and consent means. So in practice, what has historically happened is before the president makes a nomination, he will consult with senators uh, and talk about his various options that he's considering. Uh, and then when he makes <coughs> When the president makes a decision, he will send that nomination. Uh, he usually announces it publicly, as we saw a few weeks ago uh, with Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Um, and then the nomination is sent to the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, which is a committee in the Senate. Um, and they, there's usually a longer period uh, than we are seeing right now where, uh, you know, paperwork is submitted and uh, there's some vetting that goes on of the, of the nominee's background by the Senate committee. Um, but then the Senate Judiciary Committee holds a hearing, uh, which is was going on today and, and this week. Uh, and then after the hearing concludes, they will vote on the nomination and then send the nomination to the full Senate with their recommendation. Um, the full Senate then debates the nomination. And under the rules of the Senate, uh, the debate, there's no time limit on the debate. So that's where the term filibuster, oh. uh, that means when they sort of let debate go on forever so that a nomination can advance. Um, and then to end a filibuster uh, under the rules of the Senate, it's a process called invoking cloture. Uh, and uh, it used to be that you needed 60 votes in the Senate to, uh, to end debate. And now um, that has changed. Uh, it changed first for lower court nominees, but uh, and then under the Trump administration, it changed for Supreme Court nominees as well. So now you only need a majority to end debate and that's 51 votes. So then once debate has ended, the Senate will vote on the nomination. You need just a majority to confirm a nominee. 51, if the Senate is evenly split, the vice president uh, casts the uh, deciding vote. Uh, judges, uh, federal judges and justices of the Supreme Co Court are appointed for life. Uh, that also comes from the Constitution. The, the language there says, the judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior. And um, so good behavior has been interpreted uh, as forever, <laughs> unless, they, uh, unless they do something wrong, uh, in which case the only way to uh, force 
a federal judge or justice out of office is to impeach them. And that's essentially the same process uh, as a presidential impeachment, although the, um, the chief justice would not be the presiding officer, uh, but it would still, that's a congressional process to remove a, a federal judge through impeachment. Um, the court is in a, an appellate court primarily, so it hears uh, appeals from lower courts. Uh, a case can come up from a lower federal court or it can come up from a state court uh, if it involves an issue of federal law. And the process for getting review in the Supreme Court is, uh, it's another Latin term, it's called filing a petition for certiorari, uh, which is often referred to as a cert petition. The court uh, in any given year gets somewhere between seven and 8,000 cert petitions, and it only grants review in about 70 or 80 cases. So that's uh, roughly about one out of 100 cases will, will that uh, where review is sought, will the court actually hear it? And so that's that's their docket, about 70 or 80 cases a year. This past year um, was a, uh, I think the term that ended uh, in June, it was something about 50, 53 cases. And, and that was because uh, a number of the cases have been, because of the pandemic were pushed uh, to this year. Uh, so, but that was, the fewest cases they decided, I think, in 100 years or something, but uh, obviously there were extenuating circumstances. Um, and what the court looks for when they're deciding which cases to review is uh, they'll look for an issue that has divided the lower courts where, um, where courts have considered the same issue, but reached different conclusions. That's uh, typically how uh, cases get up to the Supreme Court. They'll also, you know, it may be that a case is just of such uh, overriding national importance that that justifies uh, granting review to, um, or maybe a situation where they view that there's a really clear uh, answer based on a, a prior decision of the court and the lower court just, you know, sort of ignored the, the law on that issue. <clears throat> uh, the, the process that the court follows for deciding its cases um, is that after, you know, after a review is granted, the parties to the case will file written briefs setting out their legal arguments for why they think their sh side should prevail. Um, inter interested groups that are not party to the case can also file briefs uh, explaining how the court's decision may affect uh, their interests. These are called uh, amicus briefs or amicus curiae, another Latin term, and that means friend of the court. And that's, uh, I think, really somewhat unique about the U.S. Supreme Court as compared to other appellate courts is that every, pretty much every case that the U.S. Supreme Court decides be, uh, will get uh, a ton of amicus briefs filed because uh, People pay close attention to these cases and it, uh, they obviously uh, create a rule of law that uh, applies nationwide. So there's often lots of interest groups and, um, and individuals who have an interest in the outcome of the case and will, and will file briefs to uh, let the court know their position. After all the briefs have been filed, the court holds oral argument uh, and that's in the courtroom uh, where the lawyers for the parties, uh, you know, present their position and answer the justices questions. Uh, typically each side will get 30 minutes to argue their case. <clears throat> and then after, after the argument, the case is fully submitted. The justices uh, then go and have a private conference where they discuss the case and they will take a vote on how the case should come out. And then uh, the, they announce their decision. It's usually several months between when the argument happens and when the decision comes out. Um, and it's after that conference and after they vote, uh, the decision is assigned to one of the justices to write um, either by the justice, if he's the, in the majority, or 
the most senior associate justice if the chief is uh, in dissent on that particular case. And the, the case will be assigned, the justice and their clerks will get to work on writing an opinion, and then the opinion will come out several months later, and, uh, and that announces the decision and provides usually a very lengthy explanation of the legal reasoning behind the decision. And uh, you know, that is um, so a broad overview of the, the process of a little bit of the history and uh, the process of how the court hears cases and that happy to sort of open it up to a more broader question and answer period if people have questions. Could I, could I ask uh, another question, um, Ben? And that is around judicial review. So the court's primary function, would you agree, is to review other, the state laws or laws of, uh, that are passed by the legislature, and then the court gets a, the right, in a way, to review those laws and decide whether the laws are in conformance with the U.S. Constitution. Is that uh, it's sort of a definition of judicial review? I think that's... Judicial review, it, right, I think that is a fair, is to determine whether, um, you know, whether it's a state law or a law passed by Congress, whether that law is consistent with the U.S. Constitution. Um, I should clarify, though, that a, a lot of the cases that the court hears do not have to do with the Constitution. It could just be, you know, this federal law, uh, uh -huh. the court said this federal law, you know, says X and this court said it says why, and the U.S. Supreme Court needs to decide which one is right. Um, so a lot of the cases don't have much to do with the Constitution, but those aren't usually the cases we hear about in the news. Uh, and uh, you know, the big cases about um, you know civil rights and and uh, abortion and uh, same-sex marriage and things like that. Those are often constitutional cases. Right. Um, Beth, did you ask me? I have a question. Do we have, do we have a question? A question. Yeah, Joanne or who? Yeah. Tim does. Well, can you give us an example of one of those less important um, decisions that the <clears throat> Supreme Court makes? An example of, of um, deciding between two differing opinions of a, a state law, for example, <clears throat> rather sure. than big name laws such as Brown v. Board of Education and so on. Sure, and I, I can give you an example of the, the case that uh, the state of Vermont had that went up to the U.S. Supreme Court a couple years ago. Um, and it was uh, the, the Green Mountain Care Board had a, uh, uh, it's a, a, an insurance claims database, and they required all health insurance plans to give their claims data to this database so mm -hmm. that so that state policymakers could use that data to, to figure out where the needs were in the healthcare system and things like that. Um, and uh, the company Liberty Mutual, who is a, a national company and has employees all over, all over the country said, hey, there's this federal law that's called ERISA that says um, we only have to, you know, if we're giving our employees a, a health insurance plan, we only really need to pay attention to this federal law and we shouldn't have to uh, do what Vermont says and give our claims data to this state database. And uh, so that they sued in federal court and uh, the lower federal court, um, the second circuit, which there's appeals from Vermont said, agreed with Liberty Mutual. And there was another case that raised essentially the same issue that came up, I think out of, um, Ohio maybe, uh, that had gone the other way uh, uh -huh. and, and upheld their law. And um, and so then it went up to the U.S. Supreme Court and uh, unfortunately we lost, but that, that that's an example of a... <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a question. Charlie. Charlie. Yeah. In cases of admiralty law, who hears appeals and does the Supreme Court have jurisdiction? That's a great question. Um, so in the Article Three of the Constitution, uh, it, that's where it says the type of cases that the federal courts can hear, and admiralty uh, is one of those cases. And uh, so you're not going to get. And I, I apologize, I've never worked on an admiralty case, so I, I don't really have a lot of experience there. But I know that is a uh, 
that's an area that where those cases will be in federal court. Um, Thank you. What is that in the, in the um, okay, any other questions? I, I have one, if that's okay with everybody else, unless someone wants to ask a question before that. Okay, we heard a lot today about originalism and textualism. Do you, and, um, could you kind of address those two words and, and tell us what they really mean, if you, if you know? Sure. Uh, yeah. And th those are uh, methods of interpreting the constitution and uh interpreting statutes uh and they really have become the the dominant methods of of constitutional interpretation in the past 20 years or so um and originalism uh as i understand it means that when you're looking at a a phrase in the constitution like for example due process of law or or freedom of speech or something something like that you uh you go back and you look at uh what the original mean the original public meaning was at the time that provision was ratified so if, if you're talking about the first amendment you go back and you look to 1789 um and uh and what did what did freedom of speech mean to the people who wrote those words and and what did it mean then and then then the tricky part is how do you apply that right. in 2020 um and textualism is is closely related and i think textualism um it's it's really you're looking at the words i i, I think that's often used to refer to statutes as opposed to originalism being more about the constitution but it's still you're, you're looking at the the text of the words and trying to find out what the meaning of those words meant um yeah, yeah. you know i think our supreme court the vermont supreme court um takes a little bit of a different approach when they interpret the vermont constitution and vermont statutes uh in the vermont constitution they have a uh, you know they have a I don't know if there's a name for it, but they've said in different cases that you're, you should look at a variety of things. You look at, you start with the text, but you also look at uh, the history and how the text has been interpreted. You also look at how different states have applied similar state constitutional provisions. And then they seem more inclined than the US Supreme Court to say to do more of a balancing and, uh, and look, you know, is this, you know, is the application in this particular case consistent with the the sort of the policy behind this provision um so it's a little bit of a different approach okay i'm sorry robin has a question and peter huber i think does too is that right peter yes thanks uh what okay go ahead robin peter peter <clears throat> i'm hearing about uh the shadow docket that the, what? the supreme court operates with and I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that and does that com conform with or contradict uh, an open and free democratic exchange if the Supreme Court really? Well, how about you, Ben? I don't know in how would you answer that. <clears throat> Excuse me? Yeah. That's, that's a great question. And uh, it's something that uh, has really, uh, it's really been noticeable during the Trump administration, and I think how it's, uh, it's you know, as as the Trump administration has taken various actions, then a lot of groups, including states, including Vermont, have uh, challenged those actions in court. And uh, and you know, a good example is is the travel ban. Uh, actually, I'll do a different one because that actually went to a full court decision, but. Uh, um, recently, we uh, were involved with a case about what was called the public charge rule, and that was a, a rule passed by the Trump administration that said if you uh, accept any sort of public benefit uh, for a certain amount of months, such as you know food stamps or, or Medicaid, then you won't be able to get a green card, essentially. Uh, and it was kind of a wealth-based test for um, getting immigration benefits. And so Vermont and New York and Connecticut uh, 
and other states and other courts, but we sued in a uh, federal court in New York. We got an injunction um, blocking this rule. Uh, it was affirmed by uh, the appeals court and then the federal justice department files a motion in the U.S. Supreme Court that says, you know, just they file a brief, they say this should be stayed, you know, the lower court messed up and, uh, and then the Supreme Court issues, you know, like a one paragraph or one line order uh, saying, yeah, we're blocking the lower court, we're letting the rule go into effect. Uh, mm. And so that's kind of the example of the shadow docket and it often comes up in these preliminary motions that happen. Uh, but the effect of it is to let these policies go into effect for years yeah. until until the whole case can go up on appeal. Uh, but that uh, that often takes several years. So a similar thing happened with the border wall where states sued and other groups sued to block the border wall, won an injunction in the lower court and the US Supreme Court issued a short order saying, oh, you can go forward and build the wall uh, while these cases are, are litigated. Okay, I but think Robin has a question. Okay. Oh, Peter, I'm sorry. What? No, well, it was just a follow up, but is it the, am I correct that it's the case that you don't necessarily know how the decision was reached, what the number was for and against, and there's no, no opinion or interpretation necessarily. It's just a statement of condition. Yeah. It, it often is, and which is very frustrating uh, if you're, <laughs> I mean, it's frustrating for a lot of people, but particularly if you're involved in the case and uh, had a decision below um, in your favor. But uh, some, you know, it can just be as short as like a one line, like the order is stayed. A lot of times there is a split. So one of the justices may write a decision uh, setting forth their views, uh, but there's no rule that says the, the court needs to explain why it takes an action in those those type of cases. Okay, Robin, thank you. Thank you. Up here. Okay. Hi, I wonder if you could uh, give just a, a brief uh, dissertation on the Second Amendment. Uh, <laughs> um, this uh, Amy is a constitutionalist, I think is what an originalist, which would mean she would go back to the wording of the Second Amendment, which uh, I don't have right in front of me, but it talks about militias uh, being formed and so on. Um, isn't there a substantial um, trend in, in, our, um, in, in our justice history uh, of disagreeing with the way that's interpreted now? Um, and if she were to go back to the wording, uh, if you could talk about how it is worded, and some people say it's a matter of where the comma was placed mm -hmm. in that statement. Anyway, um, just you're curious what you think about that. Thank you, and uh, you actually, I'm, uh, I'm currently working on a few gun rights cases at the Vermont Supreme Court, so you, you hit on an area that I'm happy to talk about. Um, the, uh, the Second Amendment says, a well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. So uh, it's not clear from the text exactly what that means, uh, at least to a modern reader, at least to me. Um, there was, a, I think it was 2008, um, um, the US Supreme Court issued a a decision in Heller v. Oh, District yeah. of Columbia, um, which really, you know, previously I think the general consensus was that this, the Second Amendment did not protect an individual right to own a firearm. It was more about, uh, it was more about the right of the people and the states to form militias for the, their defense um, collectively. Uh, but in the Heller decision, in, in uh, opinion by Justice Scalia, uh, he he disagreed, and and for the court, and the court held that it protected an individual right to own a firearm. Right. Uh, and that case involved the District of Columbia had essentially banned handgun possession uh, in the district, um, and the person who challenged it. 
uh, wanted to have a handgun in his home for for self defense and um, and you know the argument was that this is uh, this is the most popular weapon uh, for self defense. It's uh, kind of the quintessential self defense weapon, and the Second Amendment protects my right to have it. Uh, and Justice Scalia and four other justices agreed, and so that's that became the law of the Second Amendment. Um, and that was that was an originalist decision. Okay. Went back and looked at a lot of the history of what what was going on in the founding era, and you know concluded that you know this phrase about a well-regulated militia, like historically, that it was kind of the militia right and the individual right kind of went hand in hand because, you know, everyone was expected to be able to come when they, you know, call the militia forth and bring their weapons uh, and, and be ready to defend. And, and that, the, that history has kind of changed things and the fit between the, the two clauses isn't what it used to be. That doesn't change the fact in the court's view that uh, the right is still protects an individual right. Um, oh. I was just gonna say one other thing is that, you know, as y'all may know, there was some gun laws passed in Vermont a couple of years ago uh, and they're, uh, they're, they've been challenged under the state constitution, which has a, a similar phrase, although worded a little differently and cases are pending at the Vermont Supreme Court. We'll probably get a decision within a few months is finding out whether, uh, the new it was the ban on large capacity magazines that's that's been challenged and so the vermont supreme court will decide whether that uh, violates the state constitution or not uh, in following up with that i watched uh, what the new apparently going to be confirmed justice talked about that um, and it was interesting to me that she said that an originalist position could go back to what was meant at the time of the adoption of the Second Amendment. In other words, you can read meaning into, according to her, that an originalist position also includes a reading into the meaning and to the intent of the founders. Is that right? Is that, is that also an originalist position? Yeah, and I think, you know, the Heller decision is actually pretty interesting because both the majority opinion by Justice Scalia and the dissenting opinion by Justice Stevens uh, were uh, both kind of took an originalist analysis and went mm -hmm. back and looked at what these words meant and what was going on in the, in the founding era. Um, I think, I mean, a problem that I have with with that sort of analysis is that judges i mean it, uh, it makes sense logically i suppose but but uh judges are not trained as historians and so right, when they yeah. try to do this historical analysis uh, i think it gets risky that they're um overlooking things or looking into things that maybe they can and can't do right I mean, it was sort of, I was surprised at her statement that that meant looking into the minds also of the Americans, of people, of ordinary people, and what did they intend by kind of putting that in the Constitution. And after all, it was a revolutionary period, right? And so you're looking, I think, into people who had just won a revolution against the British, and yes, they bore arms. They and they maybe did think that it was their right to bear arms. Anyway, any other questions? Yeah? Oh. Any, any questions from those people on Zoom? Yeah? No? Okay, Beth. We'll go over here. I'm curious about a couple of things. Um, one, has anyone, has any Supreme Court justice ever been impeached and why? Um, when, can you, I have a few other ones, but I can, you could start with that if you don't mind. Uh, I think one, and uh, it was very early on, and it was as, uh, Sam and Chase, who was one of, and I actually was reading when I was getting ready for this, looking at some of the history, uh, getting ready for this presentation, and I, I so I, and I, I think he was, uh, you know, this was like early 1800s and, um, and 
he, I, I think, was just very um, partisan. And uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, kind of going around and riding circuit, like I talked about, uh, and like <laughs> giving really harsh sentences to, to, you know, people from the opposing political party and, and just kind of acting really inappropriately for a judge, basically. Uh, and so he ultimately was impeached and I believe removed from office. Um, I apologize, I'm probably getting the details on that a little bit wrong, but uh, I know that in the closer to current times, there have been talk about impeaching other justices. Um, and uh, William Douglas uh, was, uh, you know, there was threats of impeachment directed against him. Uh, and you know, he was, he was an interesting guy, a brilliant guy, but had, uh, um, you know, so, you know, had political ambitions and, uh, also, uh, was kind of a man about town in his, his personal life too. And I, I forget exactly what the reason why I think it was more of a political thing because he was, I think had been contemplating running for president while he was on the Supreme court. Um, but that never went forward. Um, there was another, uh, Abe Fortas, who was on the court for a while, I believe in the, in the sixties, he, uh, it, it turned out that he was, he had some questionable financial relationships that he was, you know, while he was on the court, uh, you know, some business interest had was like paying him a retainer to, for legal advice or something along those lines. And, uh, he ultimately stepped down when those scandals, uh, were revealed. So, um, I don't, I don't think other than that first early case that any justice has actually been removed from office through impeachment. Before I jump in, anyone else? Um, I was just going to say that, that Earl Warren, you they wanted to impeach Earl Warren, the Southerners, <laughs> after, after Brown v. Board of Education. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And, uh, and probably in contrast to sort of those other situations, I think that was directly. Oh yeah, he was not impeached, but yeah. And uh, directly in reaction to his work on the court, the you know disagreement with his decisions. Uh, but um, yeah. Yeah. Let's... go ahead, Barbara. You're on mute. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if you want to talk about this whole issue of so-called activist judges and what is the province of the legislature and what is the province of the court? Because more and more I'm hearing, you know, from this, from this nominee, our job is to interpret the law, whether it's right or wrong doesn't make any difference. Um, and it seems to me this whole notion of act you know, everybody has activist judges of its own side, but it's, it's very confusing to me. Yeah, I had a similar question, which came up a lot in the hearings today about policy, you know, because the um, Amy, Cody, War, whatever, yeah. Barrett kept talking about, don't, don't ask me to make policy. That's not the job rule. That's not the job of the Supreme Court. And so it's the same kind of thing, like where Where is the line? Where it seems are the like lines? And I think it's the same as where's the are the lines getting more blurred between the three branches? Or does that do you think so? Um it's good questions. Uh I think the term activist, speaking of Earl Warren, I, I think the the term activist sort of first began being used in response to the Warren court and uh in the decisions, you know, they, uh, in the 60s and 70s, a, a number, or 50s, I guess, was Brown v. Board of Education, uh, but, you know, they had a number of decisions uh, expanding civil rights and um, the rights of criminal defendants, and, um, and, you know, the argument was made that these decisions were not grounded in any, any words in the Constitution. It was really more these sort of broad statements of principle and what the court thought was good policy. And that, that was the argument, at least. Uh, and I think that's where the term came from. Um, but it, as it's, I'm, I think it's used mostly today to just to uh, describe a judicial decision that you don't agree with. Um, and, but I mean, as I understand it, it's means that you're, you know, 
you're not making a decision based on law. You're based, you're making it based on the judge's opinion of what should happen rather than what the law says. Uh, I think when you get to the U.S. Supreme Court and talking about, you know, what Judge Barrett has been saying and what all the justices say in their hearings, uh, I think John Roberts was famous for saying, you know, we just call balls and strikes, you know, <laughs> that's, that's what a judge does. But when you're at the U.S. Supreme Court, it's because courts have disagreed over the same law and the same issue. And so it's really, you know, a smart lawyer, a smart judge can decide the case either way and write a decision to explain that decision. So it really is choosing one or the other. And there's different, I mean, yes, there's different methods of interpretation, but, you know, if, if the question is like, does liberty include the right to end a pregnancy, you know, there's not really any text that's going to help you there. That's really kind of a, you know, really is a policy. To, you know, I think the Supreme Court, much more than lower courts, really has to make um, what are essentially policy decisions. We don't have a lot of time left, so I did want to mention. So when Judge Barrett says that she's going to follow the law, is that is really the role of the justices, correct? I mean, I think to Barbara and Beth's question, the role of a Supreme Court justice is to look at the law, right? And precedent, legal precedent, it is not to create social policy. Is that your opinion? I mean, is that correct, sort of? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly the, the role of a judge is to uh, apply the law to a given set of facts and decide the case one way or the other. I, I do think it becomes very tricky when you get up to the U.S. Supreme Court, um, where, um, you know, these are, the, these are often the hardest legal questions that judges have already disagreed about um, and there aren't clear answers. So and that, I guess the question is, what do you do? How do you decide the case in that situation? What do you look to? Do you look to history? Do you look right. to uh, more sort of broader statements of principle or like legislative intent? Um, and those are all ways to kind of, I think, cabin the analysis a little bit so that it's not um, just what do you think is good policy, but I do you think it gets pretty blurry when you get up to that level as to um, what the law requires and, and what's more of a policy type decision? Right. Okay, I think one more. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Barbara, yeah. yeah. Barbara? Um, well, a couple of things. One is that, you know, when I, we work for the union, and we wanted to do something, we used to tell our lawyers to say, this is what we wanna do now, you make it legal. And that's, that's one of the, the, the jaded view I have sometimes of the law. The second thing is, I think we shouldn't forget, and maybe you have something to say about this too, is how important public opinion and social movements are to changing laws. I doubt if there would be a law you know, that the, I doubt that the Supreme Court would have ruled in favor of gay marriage 75 years ago. But so much has happened since then in terms of um, social movements and public opinion that made that ruling possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I don't want any of us to forget that we have something to say about how things are ruled on to by, by what we do in the street. Right, Good. right. I think that's a great point. And, um, and I mean, that, that's really an amazing example of, of how quickly the law, I mean, on one hand, how quickly it changed from, you know, it, it same sex marriage being illegal in most states in the country to all of a sudden it's, it's not, but it's, I mean, it wasn't quick in the sense that people have been fighting for, for decades to, to change public opinion. And, you know, there was, cases in state court, like, you know, there was the uh, Baker decision in the Vermont Supreme Court in the 90s that uh, oh, struck down Vermont's marriage law and, and led the legislature to I have another question. create the civil union uh, and then eventually legalize same-sex marriage. And, you know, all those things happening throughout the country, I think, are very 
um, you know, it's help persuade the, the court when, it, when the issues come up there. And I have one final question. When people talk about originalism, I heard this comment that kind of un, uh, got me thinking, and that was that they're thinking in terms of an 18th century uh, Madison court, President Madison's court, or whatever, during that period of time. Well, does originalism include the amendments, which were not 18th century? The, the amendments to the Constitution were throughout the 19th and, and 20th century. So does an originalist just simply negate those amendments and go back to a time when you could have slavery? No, I don't think. Does that, they include the amendments? I think but, anybody who is serious about originalism would, would talk about when that specific provision was enacted. So if you're, mm -hmm. and what does the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment mean? Right. You need to look at the 1866 or whatever it was. Um, which is all the more reason why uh, you know it, we should amend the Constitution uh, these days. I mean, it's it's such a difficult process, but right. I think um, there's a lot to be said for making that effort to improve our democracy. But so I, one last question, Diane. Diane. Yeah, I don't I don't understand something. The Supreme Court uh, decided on uh, the right to marry or Roe v. Roe versus Wade. Um, um, they were final decisions that, you know, the Brown versus the um, edge ca Kansas, whatever it was. Uh, I thought that's like the final decision. Mm -mm. So help me with that because we're now kind of recircling, circulating these decisions that seem absolutely final. Okay, so, Ben? Um, so it's in a sense that the Supreme Court decided the you know, those you can't appeal that decision uh, and, you know, and, uh, but the Supreme Court does have the authority, uh, according to itself, to, uh, to um, disagree with earlier decisions and sort of change the law that way and overrule them. So that's what a lot of people have been talking about with uh, this nomination of Amy Coney Barrett and the belief that she is would vote to overturn Roe v. Wade and that now there's a majority of the court that would vote that way. Um, there's nothing, you know, the court, you know, the court kind of can do what it wants uh, for better or worse. So if the court has the votes to overrule Roe v. Wade, it can do that. There's a, there's a doctrine called stare decisis, which you've probably heard about um, another Latin term which I believe means like stand by the thing decided, which is that the court generally should not overrule its own decisions uh, unless there's really compelling reasons to do so. And uh, I mean, the problem with that is if the court wants to do it badly enough and they have the votes, they can, they can write down the reasons they think are compelling. Uh, uh, so, I mean, normally it, it looks at sort of maybe, you know, they, they decided that it, decision this way 50 years ago and then they have all this data showing about whole, all the horrible consequences of that decision that might be a reason why they overrule it um you know but ultimately it depends on whether there's the votes to do it um which depends on the people on the court all right any uh any final thoughts anyway i don't i think we're out of time so thank you very much ben for being here tonight and thank all our people on Zoom for Zooming in and being a part of this uh, community discussion. So next week, as I said, we'll have an in-person speaker to lead a discussion on bail, and that's Sarah George, the state's attorney of Chittenden County. And we will try to also do a hybrid for those people who do not wanna be here in person, but she will be here in person. And um, so we welcome you to come back either on Zoom or in person. This is 20 Allen Street at the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. And we thank them for the space to do this and for all the technological advice and thank Beth Sachs for putting it all together and others uh, on the Vicky board, Lou and uh, Robin. And so please come back and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank good. You for having me in your excellent question. Enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
Bye-bye. Bye, Ben. Bye.